What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyles here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pats Daily, brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner, a partner of CLNS Media. It's been about a week in a free agency. We still have another day, but the first wave is hit. We kind of know all the big signings by now. I think some people are disappointed by the way things have gone so far. So I had to get some perspective. Don't want to live in an echo chamber. We all know that. So I had to bring in my good buddy, Evan Lazar, to chop it up, figure out what's been going on over the past couple of days. Evan, how you doing, buddy? And uh, how you feeling? It's been uh, it's been active on the timeline <laughs> the past few days. <laughs> that that it has. I, I think a lot of people's emotions right now are are pretty testy, which I, I can understand. And I get that some fans are frustrated with what the Patriots have done so far. Or I guess a better way of putting it is what the Patriots haven't done so far. I, I don't think I hear a lot of, I hate to group everybody together, but I, I don't feel like I hear a lot of people mad about the moves they've actually made or the signings that they've actually made. It's just that they their free agency right now lacks that signature addition that Calvin Ridley would have been that one of the, you know, Jonah Williams, maybe, uh, you know, one of those players, uh, it hasn't gotten to that point yet where we can say this was the crown jewel of the Patriots free agent hall. And uh, that I can understand. I, the only thing that I have really pushed back on Taylor and, and we can talk about it is the fact that a lot of people I hear are that saying that the Patriots are not spending. Uh, the Patriots right now have spent the third most cash in free agency uh, behind only the Falcons who paid Kirk Cousins and the Texans who have gone crazy and, and added a lot of people in free agency. So it's not that they're not spending. They just don't have that signature external edition. And maybe the way they are spending isn't exactly the way you would have spent the money like that. I think that's just uh, where the disconnect is for some people right now. Exactly. Because I think the Gerard Mayo, like we got to burn some cash comment. Like you said, he wasn't yeah. wrong. They have been burning cash. It's just when people hear that, they think, oh, it means there's going to be a splash signing, which I feel like people might be conflating some or like kind of mixing up some of his quotes. Because there was the draft quote where he talks about we're going to get the premium position and all that. And that's where he specifically talked about what they were going to do in terms of like who they were going to add. But for agency, you just say they're going to said they were going to spend money, which they've done. So I'm curious. We've seen the money go towards mostly in-house guys. And really, we should have seen that coming. That's what Elliot Wolf said he wanted to do. That's what I was looking forward to the most. I didn't even think they were going to retain as many guys as they did. They brought back all the really key pieces of that 2020 draft class, uh, or at least retained. Mike and Wenu, Anthony Jennings, Josh Uche on a team-friendly deal re-signed. Then, obviously, transition tag on Kyle Duggar. Still probably have to hammer out a long-term deal, but with the way the safety market's going, it seems like that's more likely than not going to happen. They also keep not homegrown talents, Kendrick Bourne and Hunter Henry, but valuable pieces on the offensive side of the ball who were leaders and were guys where, yes, the offense has had its trouble over the past few years. They have not been the issue. So from your perspective, how have they done so far? Were they doing what you expected them to do? And was there anything that surprised you? How are you feeling? Yeah, I, I think that they've done mostly what they expect. I expected them to do because – Really, and I, I did a whole history lesson. I know Greg Bedard and uh, and Felger kind of started this with the, the Packer history going back to Ron Wolf in the 90s and all that kind of stuff. And when you really look at uh, the Packer way, I, I really don't like that term either, but let's roll with it. Uh, the Packer way, you really look at a team that is never been a big spender in free agency and you read about how people in Green Bay basically ignored free agency as a – way to add to the roster because their GMs never actually used free agency in an aggressive manner. So this is not too surprising. I think from that element that it's more about sustainability. It's more about keeping your own guys. It's more about, uh, you know, draft develop, build from within. Uh, but with that being said, and I, I wrote this today uh, in our mailbag, that's going to take a lot of patience from the fan base. It's going to take a lot of patience from fans and it's going to take a lot of patience from ownership and Boston is not a patient city. Like Boston <laughs> is a city where you want to win and win now. I mean, the Red Sox are certainly feeling that. And now the Patriots are feeling that a little bit. So uh, I think that that's something that you mentioned. Controlling the narrative in the media, I think, is one main critique I have of what they've done so far since Gerard Mayo took over as the head coach. It wasn't smart for him to say the burn the cash comment. It wasn't smart necessarily for Elliot Wolf to come out and say 
you know, we're going to weaponize the offense. We're going to be aggressive in free agency because you can try to do all those things and fail. You know, they, can't, they tried to sign Calvin Ridley. They just failed. So if they had added Calvin Ridley to this free agent hall, I think we're all feeling a lot differently today, not only about the fact uh, that they have Calvin Ridley, which would have been great, but also off the fact of, they, how much money they're spending in this off season in this free agent period. So I think in a lot of ways, they set themselves up for this for some people uh, yeah. by doing things that you had mentioned about the, the public comments, but overall, I don't mind the approach. It's just going to be a little bit more methodical and people are going to have to be a little bit more patient, which I, I know people don't want to hear. And we will get to Calvin Ridley. We have to, but first I yeah. do want to touch on the guys that they actually brought in to the team so really the biggest thing has been kind of bolstering up the trenches I feel like like they added Armand Watts which I feel like is going to turn into a very sneaky signing I put on the tape yeah and obviously they were looking for a Lawrence Guy replacement they were looking at Sheldon Rankins which I was excited about from a pass rush perspective but then you look at his run game tape and it's kind of like ah he's a little streaky he's got his moments but he's not really there Armand Watts way more well-rounded then you got Nick Levette, uh, someone who's got a lot of positional versatility. He's got starting experience, started in front of Tom Brady uh, for the Buccaneers. And then, like, obviously more depth signings, things where you're kind of just trying to plug holes like Jacoby Brissett. That one we saw coming from a mile away, obviously. Uh, Austin Hooper, which really felt like that was the one move I feel like fans kind of pushed back on. But then you see the reports that the Patriots are playing hardball with some of their lower profile free agents. And then I look on, uh, I actually, Brian Hines sent me a picture of Farrell Brown who posted basically saying like he felt like he was disrespected. So you kind of go, oh, oh light bulb moment. He probably is one of those people whose agent and himself weren't very happy with what they got. So how did you feel? So how do you feel so far about some of the pieces they've added? Obviously, like you said, no splash signings, but I feel like they were really smart kind of not bargain bin, but really affordable signings that could actually make an impact this season in positions that need needed. Yeah, you know, just start at, at the very beginning with Chuck Sikorafor, who I think is somebody that is a is a bridge tackle potentially as a starter and then also definitely a, a pretty good swing tackle or third tackle. And uh, I look at him, at, you know, I remember him coming out and uh, he was somebody that was really raw but toolsy, physical guy, mm -hmm. good hands, a good pass protector. Uh, but just had some rawness to his body control and, and his ability to sync up in the run game and stuff like that. I, I don't know how much he's developed in that regard necessarily, but I, I do think that he's a high enough level pass protector, uh, and especially in a play action passing scheme, uh, that they'll be able to start him for the time being at one of the tackle spots. I prefer right. I know we've talked about this a little bit off the air about him maybe playing left. Uh, regardless, though, I, I thought that that was a player that, okay, now you draft somebody at 34, Chuck Sikorafor starts the first seven or eight games, and when you feel like the rookie is ready, you, know, you pass the baton to the rookie, which is exactly what happened to Okorafor in Pittsburgh. So I, mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's a similar situation there. Uh, you mentioned Armand Watts, who I'm uh, becoming more familiar with now that they obviously made the signing. And I, what I'm encouraged by with him is uh, I agree with you that he's, you know, stat enough against the run to play, be a little bit well-rounded, but he's also a very effective pass rusher and somebody yeah. that put up some good pass rushing numbers. And as much as we all love Lawrence Guy, and I'm not trying to, you know, to crap on Lawrence Guy, a uh, guy had six quarterback pressures in like 300 pass rushing snaps or whatever it was. I think his pass rush win rate was like one and a half percent. So mm -hmm. As much as you know, stopping the run, controlling the line of scrimmage, all those things are really important. With the Watt signing, I think it, it tells me that Demarcus Covington and Gerard Mayo are looking for more splash plays outside of Christian Barmore on the defensive line. And I think he's somebody that can get some interior penetration and pressure the quarterback. I think it was 17 pressures on 155 pass rush snaps, which is a really good rate. He's one of the most efficient defensive linemen in Pittsburgh. Like his numbers yeah. don't look great when you look at them raw, but it's like, oh, he was like their fourth string, but he was producing at a really high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he was. And uh, I looked at, you know, pass rush win rate uh, as PFF clocks that. And if Armand Watts had been on the Patriots last year, the only guy with a higher pass rush win rate was Christian Barmore. So it, he's really somebody that I think with more – playing time could emerge as an even better player. So I, I look at him and I don't necessarily see a one-for-one -one Lawrence guy 
comparison yeah. because I think Guy was stouter against the run, obviously more season and that sort of thing. Uh, but I look at a guy like Guy and Daniel Aquale and those types of players that uh, do play, you know, a little bit more on the inside of the line. And I think Watts it definitely combines two of those skill sets a little bit into one player, which is can be really useful. But I know in Pittsburgh. It was mostly like a three technique, a two I, you know, maybe a zero in certain packages. So I don't know if he's going to play all the way out over the tackle like Guy would at, at times. But in general, I just really am encouraged uh, by his ability to, to get vertical and get in the backfield. How do you feel about Antonio Gibson? I feel like we were both pretty excited by that signing. Wasn't the big splash pass catcher that everybody yeah. wanted, but it was a huge vacancy they've had for a couple of years with, you know, Ramondre Stevenson. He was the leader uh, in receptions two years ago. Like, obviously, he's a fine pass catching back, but he's not the mismatch that they had when they were, you know, fielding James White or even Brandon Bolden in his last season with the team. So tell me about Gibson from your perspective. Yeah, I really liked Gibson going all the way back to school. And I sometimes I, I feel like I'm biased with, with guys like that because I, I had pegged him as a Patriots fit back in the draft. So now I feel good about myself, right? I say, <laughs> see, I saw something coming here with this guy. But I think what you really look at with him is that he played a lot of wide receiver in college as well as running back. And you can see those receiver skills, not necessarily with the route running, which is, uh, I think, one thing that you see some of that explosiveness with. Uh, wheel routes, you know, seams, getting up, you know, three vertical, four vertical type concepts. And uh, he's able to really get on guys and you can get him in matchups with linebackers and safeties and he's able uh, to run by those guys. But I think most importantly, you, you see the receiving translate to his ball skills, you know, ability to adjust on the football, uh, to high point it, to attack the ball in the air. Uh, those are things that don't always come naturally to every single running back. Yeah, then maybe they can run by a linebacker. Maybe they can get open at the top of the route, but sometimes uh, they struggle with catching and, you know, catching through traffic or contact. I think Antonio Gibson translates really nicely there. I, I just really feel like over the last couple of years, as much as Zeke helped on early downs, they put so much on Ramondre's plate to be able to play on all three downs and play in the pass game. that will be good to have somebody that's a little bit of a mismatch in that regard. Agreed, especially like a rare athlete where the guy is like almost 240 pounds, but he ran almost a no under a 4-4, I believe, yeah. in the combine. So another really interesting piece, nice little one-two punch with Ramondre Stevenson. But now going back to Calvin Ridley, obviously the Titans snuck in under the dead of night. It was, you know, Jacksonville and the Patriots for like a day and a half, two days. And then out of nowhere, the Titans swoop in and they end up signing him to a $92 million deal. So from your perspective, I was thinking, you know, I want them to spend. I don't want them to, you know, be shy about it. If you want this guy, go get him. But it felt like once it started to approach that 25-ish million dollar range, I was like, all right, maybe you got to kind of hold the line and say we're not willing to spend that. Obviously, losing Calvin Ridley means the Patriots aren't really going to have that one veteran who they know can be a consistent winner, a quick winner for whether it's Jacoby Meyer or Jacoby Brissett or a young quarterback. Do you think they should have made a harder press and maybe tried to match the Titans offer? Or do you like the fact that they said, hey, you know, realistically, this is a 29 year old receiver. He could have been very productive for us, but it's also a stacked wide receiver class. We're going to have to pass on this one. <laughs> yeah, look, it's a. Uh... It's tough because on the one hand, it's not our money. Uh, so I, I don't want to necessarily worry about Mr. Kraft's money. But at the same time, uh, it is a lot of money uh, for a 29-year-old receiver. And I think the main thing with Ridley is, is I don't want to I don't want to now change my mind after the fact and, and act like I didn't want him. Like we all wanted him and we all were excited about him coming here uh, potentially. And I, I think the biggest thing is, is that you look at those three big needs, quarterback, tackle, receiver. Uh, the hope was is that you were going to hit one of those in free agency, not necessarily to solve the problems completely at the position, but just to make it less pressing in the draft. Now it feels like you can talk yourself into taking Drake May, Joe Alt, or Marvin Harrison Jr. because they're all three of them are such pressing needs that either one of them would kind of work for the Patriots. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the scary part is by losing out on Ridley. You know, when you talk to people, I think the main thing that they were hoping was that Ridley could be a wide receiver one for the time being, really then flex into more of like a wide receiver two role with one of these rookies coming in and supplementing and you're, you're stacking together. Instead of just having to rely solely on the draft to solve everything, 
uh, you have something to work with for the young quarterback, for a young receiver to step into and then elevate it even more. Uh, so they have to go back to the drawing board. I, I still expect them. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about uh, other options now that Ridley's mm. off the board. But I do still expect them to sign a receiver uh, that let's just say that pe- people know the name. Right. Like, I, I don't think that it's going to be uh, someone that, you know, they that are. I think it will be someone with some cachet uh, that they'll they'll bring in at receiver. Uh, well, who it will be, I, I guess, remains to be seen. But I don't think that they're just going to say, oh, well, we missed out on Ridley. So uh, see you at the draft. You know, I, I think they'll try to add somebody else. Yeah, I think they really do understand that, you know, the weaponized comment. They're serious about it. They're very, very clear on the fact that more needs to be added to the offense. Kendrick Bourne and Pop Douglas, obviously, they're a solid starting point. Good wide receiver two, wide receiver three guys. But you'd still like at least one other piece that, you know, has the potential to maybe put up a thousand yard season. And then those guys could be more compliments. While, you know, think of a situation like the 2016 Patriots where Malcolm Mitchell didn't have to be the guy which allowed him to thrive even more because it's like, all right, he's not the guy that we're feeding targets to, but he can thrive in more of a reserve role. And then, you know, obviously that didn't work out because of his health situation, but it felt like he was trending towards growing into a bigger role. But We will talk about some potential backup plans to weaponize the offense. First, quick word from our friends at Pies Picks. Be right back. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. With Jason Tatum going for the MVP, I'm taking more on his points and rebounds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, so weaponizing the offense. It's still a priority. Calvin Ridley wasn't the end-all, be-all. Would have made things a lot easier, but there's still some options out there. Now, I see Hollywood Brown's name is flying in the chat. I will throw out the fact that I've seen him link to the Chiefs, and I will say, you know, I don't know if the Patriots are going to make an attempt, even if they're interested, to throw enough money at him where someone's not going to go to a place where they can get a ring. But, you know, there's still a lot of trade options. The Patriots have been connected to some people that way. Uh, So your perspective, Evan. How can the Patriots still find a way to get this offensive tools, be it at left tackle, wide receiver, wherever? I feel like weaponize the offense is going to be something that Elliot Wolf might regret. Saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's like kind of like Tom Warner saying full throttle. Like it looks so bad in, in hindsight when you you know that they struck out on Ridley. But in general, I, I just think that, you know, the one guy that I've sort of looked at in the free agent market and we can get into some of the trades as well is Mike Williams simply because I don't know about you Taylor and I know you, you've done all your homework on that, this uh, the day two X receivers like those true outside perimeter guys that can play the X spot that can face large exposures to press man coverage uh, that can win one-on-one and isolation routes uh, those guys on day two First of all, there's not that many of them, I wouldn't mm-hmm. say. And second of all, I don't really particularly love any of them. I, I, I'm not swooning over uh, Keon Coleman like some people or a Tez Walker or uh, Brendan Rice, like in the right part of the draft. OK, but he's really more of a complimentary guy, I think, in the league. So I, I look at those guys and I, I look at Mike Williams and say, well, I'd rather probably have Mike Williams to just hold down the X spot for one year in 2024. And now that opens me up to draft a Roman Wilson, to draft a Xavier Leggett, to draft a Lad McConkey, a Ricky Pearsall. Uh, those guys I find just a lot more interesting and, and a lot more exciting as a Patriots fan. So I would say that if I had to pick any of these free agents, I'd probably prefer Mike Williams just because of the position and the and the body type and the skill set uh, that he brings to the table versus going after uh, somebody like a Hollywood Brown or a Tyler Boyd. I've heard that floated out there, I believe, by Mark Daniels. Like those names, I I just 
I look at that and I say, well, I would rather some of these day two guys in the draft uh, that ha- fit that Z slot type of position uh, mm-hmm. than go after it in free agency with some of these veteran guys. What about the trade market? The Patriots have been tied to Brandon Ayuk and T. Higgins. Now, the Ayuk thing, we don't know how valid that is because, you know, the 49ers don't have a ton of incentive to let him go. They could still pick up his fifth-year option and they can tag. I think they did pick up his fifth-year option and they can tag him. or They can keep around if they really want to. T. Higgins is an interesting one, obviously. The injuries do kind of scare me personally, but he's 25 years old. You know he's got the talent to be that X, but although he's been mostly using kind of a Z role because they had Jamar Chase, what do you think about those guys? And what would you be willing to give up for either Ayuk or Higgins? So I think Ayuk is a pipe dream. I, I just look at San Francisco and I can't really understand why San Francisco would part ways with their best receiver. Like it just seems mm-hmm. to me as great as Debo is, as great as George Kittle is, outside of McCaffrey, what really made that offense dangerous last year was Brandon Ayuk. And he's young. Uh, he's, you know, in the prime of his career. He doesn't have the wear and tear that Kittle and Debo have from all these playoff runs. Like I would, if I'm the Niners, I would be looking to extend and lock up Brandon Ayuk and not necessarily shopping him in free agency because Debo, Kittle, those guys are going to start aging out and you're going to have to be able to be prepared for the next, you know, four or five years in San Francisco, which I think Ayuk fits perfectly. Uh, T Higgins is the one guy that continues to be the guy to me that is available for the Mm -hmm. right price and can be had because the Bengals, they are not this one of these big market teams that, you know, are, are huge spenders typically. And they've kicked the can down the road multiple times on T Higgins and giving him a contract extension. They didn't do it last off season. They franchise tagged him this off season. So I think he's available. Uh, I think you need to blow them away a little bit, but I would start with 34 and personally, I, I think I would offer a future pick. I, I would rather take picks from the future that maybe you can recoup and, uh, and moves on by yourself than to trade two picks from this draft for T. Higgins. So maybe you end up giving a little bit of a higher pick than you would if you traded maybe a second and a fourth this year or something like that. I'd almost rather give up a pick from 2025 uh, just so that you can maintain some of the, the picks that you have this year. I agree. And at 34, like you mentioned, they really need an X. T. Higgins can be that. There's not a lot of guys at that spot where you're probably going to get that kind of player. And, I mean, whether or not they add another tackle, it seems like whoever they get is going to be a developmental option because you're not really getting a day one starting tackle outside of the first round. So it's like, all right, even if they decide they want a double dip in the second and third round and you want that to be, you know, T. Higgins, third round, another receiver, maybe you pick up, like, I don't know, somebody slips or you get a Javon Foster in the fifth and try to get all his skill set and kind of bring that to the forefront. You also mentioned Debo. He's been the one who seems like he's actually been actively shopped. And that's where you're hearing yeah. there's about him being moved. Would you be interested in that? And what would you give up there? Yeah. I mean, look, I love Debo Samuel. I, I think he's a great player. I, I, I worry about the wear and tear and I worry about his willingness to go back to the role he was playing a few years ago and really maximize the production that he brings to the table. If he has no interest and doing some of those, uh, you know, in the backfield alignment snaps or even the scheme touches and things like that. Like that's what makes Debo Debo is getting the ball in his hands and and letting him run with it. So if he's not going to do those types of things or isn't willing to do those things, like he clearly has told San Francisco and Kyle Shanahan, I don't want to play running back. You know, don't put me at running back anymore. If that's going to be the case, then I feel like it takes away some of his superpowers. And on top of that, the the injuries from the wear and tear early on in his career of taking on so many of those hard touches. It's not just volume of touches. It's also the type of touches that they're giving him where he's got guys all over him and he's, you know, eluding or breaking tackles. I think that that does concern me as well because he's been every year now, it seems like he's missing a few games here, missing a few games there uh, because of these nagging injuries. So I'm not out on Debo. I think that would be crazy to be in the Patriots position and be out on a player of his caliber, but I'd be wary of what I would give up in a trade for Debo right now. And you mentioned like he misses games here or there, but his injury stuff is also kind of sneaky because he misses time in games and he's yeah. tough, and tough as they come. He comes back, but you're talking like he'll also just have to sit out like a quarter or two. And then it's, yeah, it's not a game, but those are still important, impactful plays where he's not going to be on the field. But like you said, the Patriots don't have anybody who has a skill set that's even close. And in this West Coast offense, I think Alex Van Pelt would do a really good job of maximizing his skill set. We kind of touched on the draft a little bit. 
But I kind of want to go a little bit deeper in there. So if they don't give up uh, 34, they still have the second round pick, a third round pick. One thing, you know, I'm going through a piece right now where I'm trying to write about, you know, all the different tiers of players they have. They don't have a blue chip offensive weapon. We know this isn't a team that's competing for a Super Bowl. But you look at all the teams in the playoffs who are actually competing, they have at least one blue chip player as either a quarterback, a pass catcher, or both. Quarterback, yeah. the Patriots go Drake May. It might take him a couple years to live up to his potential. I think he's got that potential, but it's going to take you some time. So then I was thinking, okay, maybe you decide you want to trade back a little bit, then get somebody like Aroma Dunze or like Malik Neighbor, someone where it's, or Joe Alt, someone where it's like you plug them in and you're like, this is someone who I know is going to be a home run. They're going to be a fixture in my offense for a long time. Who are some options you think, whether it's in the first round? I don't think Marvin Harrison Jr., because if you're taking him that early, I feel like you can get similar type of production a little bit later and get more picks. So within the first three rounds, who are some guys that really intrigue you as potential options for them to really get that type of, whether it's a blue chip or just someone that you can rely on a couple years down the road to be a true impact player for you? Yeah, I agree with you on Marvin Harrison Jr. And I we take a lot of flack on Catch-22 for being anti-Marvin Harrison Jr. at three, but it's it's two things. One, you just don't, you don't start a rebuild with a wide receiver. You just, that, that's just not what you do. You know, you have to build it from the foundation. Uh, you don't buy a Ferrari without a garage to put it in, right? Like you just, you, it just doesn't make any sense. And uh, I can use whatever analogy you want. I just, I'm not a big fan of that move. Uh, but if they did trade down and they accumulated and stockpiled those picks and you're telling me they're going to take neighbors or Dunze instead, I can live with that. I, I actually have all three of them in the same tier. I, I, I'm not one of those people that feels like Marvin Harrison Jr. is in a tier of his own. He's an amazing prospect. I'm not trying to downplay his talent. What the name is putting him in that different tier, I feel like, because they're comparable yeah. players. Yeah, I think they really are, and they're all a little bit different and do things a little bit differently. Uh, and, you know, Dunes a more of that, like, you know, uh, I always comp him to more of like a DeAndre Hopkins type where he's got the strong hands and at the catch point and the contested targets, but he's a really smooth route runner. Maybe not the fastest guy, but just an all around smooth athlete and gets open and things like that. Uh, neighbors is, uh, I can't, you know, you can take any of those explosive uh, guys that can get up the field vertically and, and probably use him as a comp. I, I actually think he does comp really well to Jamar Chase, even though that's kind of lazy from the LSU connection. But when you look at him and you wa look at you know his body type, his speed, you know all those types of things, I do think it, a lot of it is is very Jamar Chasey. Uh, so when you talk about those guys, I, I could be convinced into all of those uh, those two guys after a trade down. Uh, you look at day two. I will admit we talked about this guy at the combine. Taylor and I, I Xavier Leggett's grown on me a little bit. I I've watched some more film on him and yeah, he's raw. Uh, his route, he's not a route runner. He's not a, no one's going to call him a technician, uh, mm -hmm. but he's a explosive, explosive athlete that uh, has that catch and run ability, uh, you know, to catch those in breakers and then be off. He can run through the defense. I, I look at him and I can't help. He's a little shorter than AJ Brown. Um, and he's a little bit more of a receiver, I would say, than Debo. So I don't think yeah. that either one of those comps is perfect. But at the same time, I just can't get the 2019 draft out of my head and be like, they passed on this exact type of player twice in the draft. And they drafted the wrong type of guy in Nikhil Harry, uh, who they thought was in that category, but wasn't. And I just feel like Xavier Leggett is going to end up being a, a Debo AJ Brown clone at the next level. And we're going to be like, why, why did they, they not do this this time around? So I, I feel like that's almost like making up for the 2019 draft by, by targeting a guy like Leggett. Uh, I really also, I uh, am a big fan of AD Mitchell's. I think he's going to probably go in the first round, but uh, if you can trade up and, and not give up too much from 34 to sneak back into the end of the first round, I have A.D. Mitchell ranked as my fifth wide receiver right now uh, behind the big four, big three plus, uh, you know, uh, Brian Thomas Jr. So uh, I feel like those two guys at the top of, of the second round are, are my prizes there. Uh, I like the Ricky Pearsalls. I, I love, you know, the guys from Washington. I think all those guys have talent, but probably more as complimentary receivers. I don't necessarily see them developing into true stars, you know, true uh, guys that are engines to your offense necessarily. Uh, but I, I think all those guys can play and would be good picks, let's say, at 68. I agree. Because 
a lot of the receivers after you get past the big four, it's like they're either really fast, but they're really frail. And even like Xavier Worthy, like people will kind of compare him and like Troy Franklin to like a Tyquan Thornton. Like one Worthy, I think, is a much better route runner. Like yeah. he's a football player where he as a technician. I really like his skill set, but the size scares me. And then Troy Franklin, not as great a route runner, but I don't think he's like Taekwon because he's legit after the catch. Like he doesn't need a runway like Thornton does. He really has some wiggle and can make some, some of his own plays when he's out in space. But like you said, with AD, he's got the size, he's got the explosiveness, and he's got the route running chops. And with Leggett, yeah. is he a technician? No. But he doesn't let guys keep their hands on him, which I love from a receiver. I like when guys try to jam you and you're like, ha, no, that's not going to happen. He snaps off routes crazy well for a guy his size. And you yeah. see the effort to get into blind spots and make sure the corners get uncomfortable. And plus, if you're a receiver who's got good size where he can win on high points and win on jump balls downfield, he's fast enough where I think, you know, he's not going to burn guys, but I think he can have success downfield. And he's good after the catch. If you can threaten those areas of the field and work on the intermediate game a little bit, I think you're going to have a lot of success. And he's good on the crossing routes as well, which I feel like will still be a, fo a focal point of this offense. So I agree. Yeah. If you got to give up like maybe, I don't know, like a future one or something like that to get back into the first round to get Nadine Mitchell, I think you do it. But get that and then yeah. maybe third round you can get another weapon or your tackle or whatever. I really like that plan. Anything else you want to add? Yeah. You no, I just on Leggett, you know, I think one thing when we talked initially about him, I was at the senior bowl. He had a rough couple of days of practice at the yeah. senior bowl. And it's hard not to have that skew your opinion on the player because oh, of like. of him. yeah. Yeah. What he looked like yeah. in mobile. And then the second thing I would just say with him is that, you know, at 221 pounds, uh, he is somebody that moves really fluidly and I think could develop a little bit more as a route runner. He's a late, he's a late breakout guy and he didn't get a ton of opportunities early on in college. Uh, so he's grown on me a little bit and I, I, I could see that uh, him being a really out of all these guys that we talk about on day two in terms of just pure upside. I think Xavier Leggett is at the top of the list. If you just want to go, you know, one of the things that I have learned over time and trying to get better at this yeah is that you you have to be able to win it through contact at the NFL level. It's one thing to watch these guys in one-on-ones at the Senior Bowl, watch these guys at the Combine, and guys like Ladd McConkey and Ricky Pearsall and those players, they're uh, worthy. Uh, they're going to put on a show in those settings. Roman Wilson's another one of those guys. But if you can't play through contact in the league, because everybody in the NFL is fast, everybody in the NFL is physical, so you're not going to just get all of these – off coverage reps where everybody's you know eight ten yards eight yards 12 yards down the field already and all you got to do is like threaten vertical and then stop down on a comeback route and you've got separation like that doesn't happen as often in the nfl and i think that that's one thing you know strength through press coverage but also just through the entire route uh, going and finishing through contact contested targets like being able to finish at the catch point uh, those are things that I feel like I stress more now than I maybe did earlier on when I was just looking for the the flashy route runners on film. Like, who are the guys that really lose people in coverage? Uh, so I, that's why I feel like guys like Xavier Leggett, A.D. Mitchell, um, those guys have grown on me a little bit. And then, and obviously it matters what you do on the field. That's the biggest thing. But also, yeah, sure. you got to love the personality and the backstory. Like, he's Leggett is a guy who's overcome a lot. Really tough dude. Uh, seems very personable. I talked to him at the combine, just listening to him answer questions. I was really, really impressed. Any other time I've heard him, now he's starting to catch on and people realize he's got that like really low voice and that kind yeah. of southern Boris Gumpy kind of accent. Uh, but also he was a team captain. And this is a team where I think they are going to value character guys, especially as you rebuild. You want to have some of those young guys who can start taking accountability as they get older. So, you know, obviously not the most important thing. It matters what you do on the field, but that's another part of his game where I'm just like, I can't see the Patriots not loving Leggett. Plus, we already know that he met with them at the Combine and they went to his pro day. We'll touch on that later, but they're not really hiding it. I think that he's someone that they are legitimately interested in. We're going to get away from offense real quick. So we have to mention the defense. One of the things that the Patriots mentioned they wanted to do, or at least that was reported, was that they wanted to add an elite defender. There weren't many of those guys on the market. You know, it, it, that's kind of just how free agency goes. I feel like we know that these kinds of players don't usually hit the market. If they do, there's a reason. Christian Wilkins, 29 years old. Obviously, he signs the big deal to go to the Raiders. 
where he was one of the guys along with Ridley where I was like, if you're going to throw a bag at somebody, do it at these guys. They're really good fits. You know, I feel like, uh, especially Wilkins, like personality wise, I would give my left foot to see him and Judon in the same locker room and play on the field together. That would be just excellent for content. But I also understand them not wanting to pay that much for a guy his age. Daniil Hunter was somebody who then it kind of felt like fans were like, all right, now he's the guy. Never yeah. felt like a great scheme fit. I'm sure like, you know, with a productive player, you figure it out. He ends up going to the Texans who fit much better. And obviously they've already got playoff aspirations. So how do you see the Patriots reinforcing the defense anymore? If you see them doing it at all, one big move I'd like to see, we saw the Jaguars say, all right, we're going to take our Calvin Ridley money, invest in the defensive trenches. They went and got Eric Armstead. Be kind of nice if the Patriots had something similar with Christian Barmore. But uh, if you want to touch on that, any other moves you think they could make, fire away. Yeah, I definitely think that it would be good to get out in front of the Barmore thing. I mean, I'm not as concerned because he's obviously not a free agent until next year. So they have some time to work that out with him. Uh, but I'll, I'll, steal, I'll steal Bar's take. I think the one guy that, that does interest me is Stephon Gilmore, uh, just because they have been looking for that third outside corner. You know, Gonzalez is coming back from the injury. You have Jonathan Jones. Uh, you have some guys that can play on the inside. I also reminded myself last night that Miles Bryant is still a free agent. And I, I know they play different positions, but I don't know if the Miles Bryant era with Bill Belichick has uh, you know gone, has come to an end as well. Uh, but I look at Gilmore as a guy that I think is still a starting caliber corner in this league, but is probably better cast as a number two corner on the mm -hmm. outside. So you have, you have Gonzo on one side to really take those number one matchups. You have Gilmore on the other side to take the lesser receiver. Not only is it a, a good fit just to kind of bolster that secondary, and complete that secondary. I also love the idea of Gilmore mentoring a guy like Christian Gonzalez because uh, of his demeanor, his playing style, like all of it is very similar. I covered mm -hmm. uh, Gilmore for a couple of years when he was with the Pats and uh, very, very similar guys, quiet, um, you know, a little bit more reserved, uh, but not, I wouldn't use the word humble to, to describe <laughs> Stefan Gilmore. Uh, he knows he's good. You know, he's, he's definitely somebody that has that quiet, cool confidence about him. I think Gonzo is similar. So I, but there's a lot, lot of corners that are still out there uh, that I think could be uh, useful players. And I look at this market and interior pass rushers, edge rushers, uh, those guys that get after the quarterback always were highly coveted, but it feels like that market has moved significantly. Whereas the coverage guys, it hasn't quite moved to the back end. It's almost flipped, you know, for a couple of years there, it was the other way. Now we're back to paying pass rushers. So I, I feel like that's something that maybe you can get a little bit of a deal on. Cause I, I don't know how big of a market Stefan Gilmore has right now. What do you think about safeties? Because one thing I figured Miles Bryant resigning him would make sense because he gives you so much versatility. He played yeah. safety. And then obviously Jalen Mills wanted a starting job. So he's out. And obviously Adrian Phillips are trying to get younger. But it looks like for me, a lot of the safety options on the market are guys that are going to want to be starters. Where with the Patriots, they might be a number four because you got Duggar most likely staying in the fold. You got Peppers. I don't think Marte Mafu is going to transition to full-time linebacker. I think they're going to use him there in certain packages, but I think he's going to be in that kind of big nickel rotation where he plays deep sometimes. He plays in the box. He plays linebacker. So is there anybody on the market you think can maybe fill that spot, or is that something they might address later in the draft? Well, I, I love Justin Simmons. I always have loved Justin Simmons. I, I feel like he's a player that, you know, I when I, um, I did an interview with Devin McCourty, uh, beginning of last year and just talking about them replacing him in the back end and how that was going to work. And he said, they have plenty of talent between Kyle Duggar, Adrian Phillips, Jabril Peppers, uh, Mapu. Uh, they have plenty of talent, uh, but the problem is, is that they don't all have a home. Like there's not a, a specific role for those guys. And he, he hearkened back to uh, the secondaries that he really identifies with, with Chung and, and Deron Harmon and those guys. And, he said when they it came down to money, it came down to winning time, you know, third down, fourth quarter, tie game, they all knew the spots that they were going to be playing and where mm -hmm. their responsibilities were going to be. Harmon was going to be in the deep part of the field. McCordy was going to be more of that robber, uh, you know, intermediate role. Uh, Chung was obviously going to be manned up against the tight end. And they knew where they were getting to all the time. Whereas I think with this secondary, as cool as it is to say, oh, we have these interchangeable guys, they don't really have guys that, A, fit the center field role, but B, 
they don't they okay interchangeable is cool but who's going where when it comes down to it and i think that's important as well so i look at a guy like justin simmons and i say you put him in center field now all of a sudden kyle duggar can go back to playing closer to the line of scrimmage which is really where he really belongs jabril peppers plays in his spot and you get into that three safety look and now all of a sudden everybody fits in a little bit better so i i love simmons for them I think that would be a, a great signing that I, I would be excited about. I think it would it wouldn't necessarily save free agency for some people, but I think it's a name that people would know as well. I keep considering it, but I just feel like Jabril Peppers and Duggar. I feel like are guys you want on the field every play. Like Peppers yeah. was good in that deep center field role. Probably don't want him there all the time. You want to be able to move him around, and he couldn't really do that as much last season. So do you how do you think that would work out? Like, do you think Simmons would be okay with maybe taking a bit of a back seat in this point in his career? Because it seems like he's still playing starting caliber of football. I'm just not sure how that rotation would work if you were trying to have three safeties. Like we know they use a lot of safeties, but when it comes to like the regular nickel defense where you have a true slot corner on, somebody's got to be off. Yeah, that that's a good point. And if you play like three corner nickel, you know, more it's more basically base nowadays, mm-hmm. right? Three yeah. corner nickel. Uh, that that's going to make it so one of those guys might not necessarily be out there unless you start getting creative with Duggar at linebacker, you know, true linebacker or something like that. So I hear you on that. I, I do wonder how Simmons would feel about not necessarily going all the way down to a, a Deron Harmon role. Like he's too good, I think, to, to put him all the way there. Uh, but you look at how often they're going to play six defensive backs, how often they're going to be in obvious passing situations. And there's still probably 65, 70% of the snaps to get to all three safeties. So I love Drew Bill Peppers. He had a great year, great locker room guy, great energy guy. I do wonder if that was more of like a peak season for him last year. Mm-hmm. And I would just really love to bring Kyle Duggar back to the line of scrimmage uh, where he's so much better uh, than he is playing up top. So I uh, maybe Justin Simmons isn't the right guy because he's going to make too much money to put him in a, as a role player. Maybe it's somebody else that they have their mind eye on, but I, I don't feel like you can really target free safety in the draft with a, a high premium need right now. It's just way too many other needs on the offensive side of the ball. So I'd love to go out and get somebody like that that can play that position in free agency. Yeah, and all the mocks, the only time I get a safety if it gets like the sixth or seventh round, they have two six. So I'm like, all right, maybe there. Like once you fill yeah. all the big holes, and then it's like, all right, we're maybe looking at like a guard or like a you know a running back or something in that regard. But I totally get it. It's 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 gonna be interesting to see how they end up filling that role. Now I want to talk about the pro days because the Patriots have been reported to be in a lot of the big name pro days. I know they were at Clemson. I'm going to bring it up right here. So they were at Oregon with uh, TC McCartney was there looking at Bo Nix. They were at South Carolina looking at Leggett, Oklahoma or Tyler Guyton. I think uh, Scott Peters was there. So obviously he's at the top of that list. Georgia looking at line, wide receiver, defensive back. Very smart. I like that they're paying more attention to Georgia than I feel like they have in the recent years because it's like, these guys are just sending like be the Eagles. Just get all the players from the good yeah. college programs. You can't you can't um, do that to Saban, man. You got you know you got to stay loyal to your program. Well, he's gone now. They're both gone now, right. so we can start. Yeah, exactly. we go. Hopefully, we get a Washington pipeline going. I don't know if you saw my mock. I was yeah. like, you know what? We're just letting Tyler Hughes get all his guys from Washington. Yeah. Um, then they obviously went to Clemson as well in Arizona. They reportedly went to so. What are some of your takeaways? Like from those schools, are there some guys really pop out to you that you think, yes, these would be really good additions, even if it's not necessarily the early round guys, even if there's some maybe later guys uh, that you have your eye on? Yeah, look, I, people are not going to like it. That I, that I keep saying that, but I just feel like people aren't going to like Bo Nix. Like, but I think Bo Nix is is not moving the needle enough for some people. But at the same time, when you're in these this process, you have to be doing your due diligence on all the quarterbacks. And at 34, Bo Nix is really in play. If they don't pick a quarterback at three, uh, I think Nix is probably more likely to be there than Penix at this stage after Penix got the the all clear at the combine medically. So I I think that Bo Nix has some things going for him. There's definitely some tape from last year that's really encouraging. You know, you talk about really uh, doing a lot of different things that uh, translate to the league from accuracy, timing in the pocket, arm strength, uh, you know, in terms of uh, mobility, I think he's a little bit more, I guess, toolsy than Mac Jones was. I don't mm-hmm. think it's it's not as toolsy as Drake May is, right? But there's there's kind of levels, and I think Bo Nix is a little bit more toolsy in terms of his mobility and his arm talent. 
But at the same time, I understand that he's uh, the comp that I heard from him uh, from Daniel Jeremiah, which I thought was great, was he's basically Alex Smith of college football, right? Where it's a lot, it's a lot of check downs, it's a lot of short throws. Every once in a while, if somebody's wide open down the field, he'll throw a bomb, but he's not a very aggressive downfield passer. So there's not a lot of impressive down the field throws from him on film like there are with some of these other guys. But you got to do your homework uh, on Bo mm-hmm. Nix. And I, I think that that's an important thing uh, for them to do. I'm, I'm actually going to LSU in North Carolina for their pro days. Uh, back-to-back days later this month. Uh, so I'll be there for Jaden Daniels and Drake May. And so we'll see who's there at those ones. I They're either not going to send anybody because they don't want to tip their hand or they're going to send the whole freaking crew. I don't know which one it's going to be, but I, I always don't – I try not to look too much into the pro day stuff uh, just because mm-hmm. of all the, the 30 visits and the private workouts and things like that that do happen behind the scenes. Uh, but it is important uh, part of the process for some of these guys. You talk about not tipping your hand. One player that I'm, I kind of think it's odd that they haven't shown any interest in is Michael Penix Jr. I would understand yeah. why if there sincerely isn't any, but it's also like, okay, if you are interested in him or any of these Washington guys, you have someone who was in the building. So, you know, you don't need to meet somebody at the combine for 20 minutes if you have somebody who was there with him for an entire season, kind of getting the intel who has a feel for him and can kind of relay a lot of that information. Uh, Evan, it's been a blast, buddy. I will let you have the rest of your night first. Let the people know you can find him at Patriots.com if you don't know already. Spoiler alert. But let the people know what you got coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, so just draft related really quickly. We're, we're pushing out a new show. It's called Patriots Draft Countdown. And it's going to be all focused on the draft. So uh, we did our first uh, live show yesterday uh, talking about all the different positions and sort of resetting needs and things like that. But uh, next week, I actually just did our interview with Brandon Thorne. We're doing a full offensive line podcast. So Brandon's on there. Uh, we have a team of guys uh, from Patriots.com talking about the, all the offensive line and mostly tackles, of course, in the draft and uh, all that kind of thing. So we'll keep doing uh, those every single week for through now through the draft and uh i also doing some some touch screen film breakdowns in those as Ooh. well so you see that pull off the little dan orlovsky action there so uh, <laughs> a lot of cool stuff on that show it's called patriots draft countdown all right i'm excited to see that as i'm sure everyone is appreciate you coming on again buddy appreciate you all for watching now take care of yourself